Now, what a weekend of football. Any weekend that starts with Tom Hanks pumping his fist after an Ollie Watkins goal has a certain charm. And so it continued. We have Arsenal coming through adversity in what felt like must-win territory. Manchester City then have one of those days. There are signs of life at Liverpool. Manchester United are suddenly three points off City and things are not so pleasant for Graham Potter at Chelsea. Loads to get through. It has been a long time. Pat Nevin, long time no talk. Hello. Hello, hello. Um, I've been a wee bit busy. <laughs> I've been on once or twice, but we've kind of missed each other. We have. Uh, time and again. Um, but calm down. Normality again. Other than the fact that I've done five games in ten days. So it's been bizarre. <laughs> and I've seen all the big teams. Like I've, I've been to see Arsenal. Uh, they played Brentford last week. Went to see Spurs over in Milan. Uh, and then Chelsea Dortmund. And then I was at the Manchester City game at Forest at the weekend as well. Um, so it's you know, a whole bunch of games at the moment. Um, but none of the big teams win when I go to see them. <laughs> Can we start with Chelsea? Super interesting at the moment. It is. It's extraordinary. I mean, there was a massive whisper. I don't know if you heard that. There was a big, big, big hint going around yesterday uh, that Graham Potter would be uh, relieved of his duties. Um, I heard that from about seven or eight different sources. You know, And I, I'm not talking online. I'm talking media sources and people that usually know what they're talking about. Um, but it would seem that uh, Todd Bowles came out and said, no, no, we're going to stick by him. This is a long-term plan. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not going particularly well just now. Um, but the kind of theory behind it, they seem kind of strong with. And I have to say, I'm beginning to feel a wee bit lonely in this because I get it. <laughs> I absolutely get it. And it's not pro-Chelsea or anything. It's just all those kids. Um, and expecting them to go and waltz in and be a decent Premier League team right altogether. Now, they cost a fortune. An absolute ridiculous fortune. But the, the vast majority of that team is 23 or under. Um, and it's going to take a wee while for them to gel. And uh, if what they said at the start, when they came in, uh, Bowley and his group, that this was holistic, this was a build, this was a, a, a complete change in not just personnel, but outlook. Um, well, this is the biggest test they're, they're ever going to get. <laughs> you know, and they're not winning games, they're not scoring goals. They're not probably not going to get Champions League. They could be out of the Champions League itself in a couple of weeks' time because they've won down already. Um, so that's a big test of whether, you know, what they said at the start, if they're going to stick by it. Um, I, I can't remember, I'm sure I've said it before, I kind of think they will. I, I just kind of think they will. They, they see quality players and they see something, um, but they just can't score a goal, full stop. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be interesting. On paper, their plan made perfect sense and was very interesting. Let, let's go for this more holistic, patient project. And you can see how they arrived at thinking that was the way to go here. You could argue there's a level of inexperience about that hierarchy, though, which doesn't take into account what we have seen time and time and time again in football. There is a lack of rationale at times to media criticism, and we'll come to Potter is just far too reasonable in just a moment, but there is a, a lack of, of fairness to that, and that builds its own momentum. And then there is a toxic element which comes uh, in the stance. And again, that, that can be difficult to turn. And a dressing room is, is, is subsequently lost. And I'd say it's easier to lose when you have 33 players in that dressing room blinking black at you, going, well, how's this meant to work in training every day? There's 33 of us. What do we do? And so you can arrive at a point where the whole thing unravels and the only easy-ish reset is change of manager. And I just wonder if they've underestimated that whole sphere. They may have. Um, I would give you the alternative argument. I'm just giving you the alternative argument, which is, yeah, they've got far too many players. A whole bunch of them are not going forward with them, but you can't get rid of them that easy they will feel as if they have the group that they want going forward, which will generally be the young ones uh, by the start of next season. We'll have had a season under their belt. Um, have they, have, have, have they got the cojones to say, right, I know you're all, you're all fed up. I know we're getting pilters, as we say in Scotland, from the press and from social media and from everywhere. Um, but we believe in this. And the reason why I'm kind of, I think they will, and I've got... Because I've kind of done it before. I thought, right, no, no. I know, I know why you're all having a dig, and I know that you all see the headlines that don't look good just now. But I'm looking at the, the kind of the basics, and then they're okay. 
they're fine. The 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 plan, um, and it might just be someone whose glass is always half full, you know. And like I watched the first half against West Ham recently, they were utterly brilliant. I mean, honestly, Chelsea were brilliant. The game against Dortmund is one of the best games I've seen this season. It's absolutely fantastic, and there was some great stuff, some great opportunities, and they should have scored a couple of goals at the very least against a good European side away from home. And one 0 was pretty unfair on them. Um, probably a draw would have been a fair result, but you know, two two or a three three draw would have been there. Um, I didn't get to see the whole game at the weekend there, but certainly in some of the games recently, the part of the game against Fulham, you know, it's it's fine, it's okay. Here's one argument. Do you know if you win the league or if you're in the top four, there's this kind of rule. You don't you score you you give away a goal a game or less, right? And that gets you top four every single season. Chelsea are a goal a game, they're losing. They're fine. They're okay back there. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> so there's one problem. They're now creating pro chances, which they hadn't done before, but they're not finishing them. So that was another problem. So that's kind of nicked off as well. You still get the biggest problem you've got. <laughs> the biggest problem in the game is actually scoring these goals and, and actually putting away these chances. Now, if they believe, actually, this is just weird, that's, you know, it's a, a run of a, a number of young players that are just getting together, a bit of bad luck on top of that, a whole bunch of injuries as well. If they believe that, they need to stick with they, no, they don't need to. They might stick with Graham Potter. Um, but it's tough because there's very, very few people on, t on side now. Um, a lot of the fans turned it uh, during the, the game there. Uh, had they been in Dortmund, they wouldn't have. You know, that, and that's only four days before. You know, so you have to have a longer view when you're running and running a, a business. And if you believe in what you put in place, then you, got to, you, got, you should stick with it and have a go. The other argument is Mikel Arteta's first season, eighth, was it? They ended up. And everybody, you can just try and think back. Everybody, but everybody wanted them out, including a vast swathe of the Arsenal fans wanted them out. And look at them now. Um, it's pushing it a wee bit, but it's, you could make the argument that Pep Guardiola was getting slaughtered. Certainly on TV, he was getting slaughtered for, how can you play out for the back? That doesn't work in English football. And we had that discussion at the time. Mm. So if you believe that Potter's got the answers, and you believe that these young players, not all, but most of them will develop and will become top players in two, three, four years' time. That's why you give them eight-year contracts. Then maybe you do stick with it. And maybe you don't buy in the next hired gun who only wants to stay there for a year and doesn't develop it. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the holistic thinking. That, that's not my thinking. That's the holistic thinking. And that's why I've said, said all along, I think I know what they're trying to do. Hmm. And I think they're going to stick with it. Uh, the conversation around Potter is really interesting. So it's um, it's kind of frustrating in some respects because uh, winning cures all and if he was fiery and criticising referees and running onto the pitch and gesticulating and, and, and all of the, the things that people are saying he's currently lacking, too reasonable is one of the main complaints. Uh, if he was doing all those things and they were still on this current run of form, uh, you can bet your bottom dollar people would be saying he needs to be calm, he's operating at a higher level here, he needs to show more composure. So uh, I get the, the nonsensical uh, aspect to some of the criticism. However, there, there is perhaps something in the point people are making about there is a, uh, I don't know, is it ego or sense of self or presence that is, it seems to be required at these uh, big clubs. You know, and people would say, you know, Moyes at Manchester United never filled that seed in his demeanour. And that is part of the role. Harshly or otherwise, that would be the criticism of Moyes. Where are we in our, in our thinking when it comes to Potter and just how he has sat into that, that Thomas Tuchel-sized uh, vacancy demeanour-wise? Yeah, it's, uh, I think that's really interesting because that's a very football attitude, you know, with it for business, for any business. If you're a management or a controller, you, it has to be a big ego. I am the man. It's all one dimensional, and that's the way to do it. Not all businesses work that way. Some do. Some work really well that way. Um, Chelsea like, traditionally have worked very well that way. Bigger the ego, have, the more comfy you are in that chair. And they got hammered for it. <laughs> but in the end, that's not their business model. And I think their business models, 
I think it's more along the lines of look, look around. Who are the ones that are doing well? Well, Liverpool did well. How long did they have the manager for? Arsenal did well, doing well. They've kept with the manager. Manchester City did well. They've kept with the manager. If you chop and change and chop and change and chop and change, it's going to cost you that half a billion quid every year. Yeah. And I, I don't think they fancy it, really. I think they think, no, no, let's see if we can get something that's kind of looks planned that, you know, will be a fruit in a period of time. I'll be honest with you, at the start, and I'm, I'm absolutely honest with you, and I would hold my hands up now, I, I thought it was scattergun. I thought it was a mess. I, I mean, I thought, you know, Kilabali and Aubameyang and all that. I'm thinking, really? What does that all fit? But it, it's clearly it was just they had to get numbers in quick because they hadn't been able to buy a player for such a long time and they lost a number of players after, you know, they were banned from buying players in during the sanctions. So look, I get that. That was extremely... And it seemed like a lot of money at the time. Why are you spending 40s and 50s and 60 million player pounds on, like, Cucurella? Mm. Um, and then you look at them now and you think, well, that's not a lot of money, actually, for them. That's actually... They can they can seem to be able to afford it. Um, I, I mean, I'm I'm intrigued. Do you know what I would like? In a personal way, yes, in a personal position, I'm giving you what I think they're thinking is right, and I can see it now. I couldn't kind of see it before. It, it looked a bit scrambled, but I can see it now, and and I think they actually seem to be balls enough to to stick by it for the moment. Which yeah, I'm kind of happy they are, because I would love to know how it turns out. I'd like to know how this one turns out. You know, because yeah, if you've got Joe Felix, if you've got Mudry, if you've got, you know, Enzo Fernandez, if you've got Havertz, who's only 23 as well, if you've got all those young players at the back are coming through, Reese James, 22, you put all of them and give them two years together. I'm really interested with a manager who's known for building, who's known for, you know, improving players, you know, and he's actually got nobody from the outside. You talk about that big squad, that's fine if that big squad is older pros are fed up. Say it's not. Say it's younger pros that you can manipulate and you can mould. That's interesting to see with that going. I'd love to see it because you hardly ever see it in football. I'd be intrigued to see it. It may not work, but I'd like to see it. And the, the one thing I'm seeing now and again with Chelsea when I watch them, they're kind of better to watch at the moment. Yeah. They're not scoring any goals. No, I give you that. Really good to watch. And, and, and your sense of, like, when you, let's compare him to his immediate predecessor. Tuchel arrived, first game changed the formation, made sense of this uh, supposedly unbalanced squad, gave an interview afterwards which just spoke confidence. I remember watching that lunchtime kickoff that Saturday, can't remember who they played at Stamford Bridge, and I thought, wow, this is instant. So Potter, like he's made a few missteps. They're like Even his interview post-match uh, at the weekend, talking about, oh, we had a few enforced changes and, and, and talking you know, in these terms and... That just doesn't cut it when you look at what Southampton have to play with, you know. Uh, his confidence levels. I mean, so you talk about two years' time. Is he going to survive two years' time being scrutinised this way? Fans, that I'm, I'm, I'm less sure. What's your sense of him and, and his internal um, uh, attitude to this I, whole situation? I have a suspicion that it, the thing that's been said about his technical ability as a manager... I don't have a problem. I think he's fine. I think he's good enough okay. of of a, of a good level manager. Uh, with the money he's got and the personnel he's got, I think he's fine. That other side you're asking for, that's the most interesting part because he's never had this. No, I mean, very, very few managers get this level of scrutiny and get hammered like this to this level. You know, he's had a lot of jobs in the past and there's enough pressure in jobs when you're near relegation or you're having difficult times. There's enough pressure in them, you know. When if you get sacked for this job, you don't know how you're going to pay the rent. It's not that type of pressure now. It's a different type of pressure now. And it's, it, it, it's no one, no, everyone who says they can cope with it completely without caring is not telling you the truth, mm. right? So he's feeling it and he's learning it. Um, I don't know how he'll come out the other end of it. It will be intriguing to see. I think he'll be hardened slightly by it. He will be hardened by it. And maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe hardening up in this white hot heat that you need to get that he's going to be put in now because you know, in two years or one year two years time probably one year i would say not even two the expectation is your top four minimum i mean then you're not mucking about now right okay you've had that period now do it let's see and by the way where was where you're winning we won't be enjoying it and we won't be entertained we want to see something special and something different so 
that's not going to go away. That level of pressure and that level of expectation is never going to go away as long as he's at Chelsea. So how he copes with it, and it's in the simple terms, you get back to everything else. We could talk around a lot of things. If he wins two or three games in a row, or if he had won two or three games in a row, he wouldn't be bothered. He'd be all right. He'd be fine. And that's all it comes down to. Nothing else than that. We can skip around a lot of things with him. But he'll be looked upon as a, a sphinx-like character who yes. knows what he's doing as soon as he gets two or three wins. Um, but he, it's looking tough just now because you look at the run, it's Spurs at the weekend away from home. Yeah. You know, that's not going to be easy. And of course, Spurs fans, Chelsea fans, you're angry when you get beat by anyone. You're furious when you get beat with Spurs and the end of a stinker of a run. Yeah. So, yeah. The, the be interesting. The yeah. I, and I quite like, I quite respect he hasn't done something cheap like get involved with a referee or lost the plot on the sideline. He's been true to himself and, um, you know, it, the criticism of these managers can just be so silly at times. Uh, Arsenal, we'll touch on in a moment, do their thing against Villa in the end. You were at City Forest. So Guardiola oh. said it was a very good performance and I, I, like most people I suspect I saw the highlights and I just watched City miss chance after chance after chance and then the sucker punch came. Is that a fair reflection of the game? I would say by at half time a fair result would have been 5-0 okay. and also it was 86-87% possession but good possession yeah. getting behind the, the lines playing at a really high tempo Foden was super down the right you know Certainly Grealish was not bad. He was, in fact, good down the left. Goes down too easily, we know that. But they were really up for it. They were battling, they were chasing, they were making chances, they were getting into brown positions and it wasn't falling for them. And then it kept on going and the chances kept on coming. And I have to say, I thought they were brilliant for about 55-ish minutes, 60. And then it's just, you know what, when the second goal didn't come, a couple of things happened. Forest changed their system, which well done by the way, brilliant. They, they, they were they didn't change it when they went a goal down. They were clever because they changed it when they go down. They're still under the caution to get shredded, right? But they waited and they waited and they waited, and it was the old rope a dope thing where if you if you get the the wrong punch now you're out, right? But they held on and they held on. When they made the changes, you could see the uncertainty just coursing through. It was about 67, 68 minutes. Can't remember roughly about then. And I was doing a commentary and I said, hey, this isn't over. Oh, dear. I, I can see this has just changed now, totally changed. And, and Pep Guardiola, having gone mad for a while, then started sitting down as if to say, oh, God, I've spotted that too. And he, did, he said the opposite in these press conferences, but you don't take a, a hint of that. And it was brilliant tactics by, by Forrest. They then actually took control of the game. So, yeah, for City... 99 times at 100 in that game they win it and they win it comfortably and everyone's cooing about how great they were and it just needed one of those chances to go in and it was a brilliant performance but they weren't able to keep up for 90 and by the end I was not even slightly surprised that Forrest got the, the equaliser not saying they absolutely deserved it but they fought and they battled and that's just the way you need to do it against yeah. City and I thought technically they were, they were superb they knew where the weakness was and everybody the dogs and cats in the street know where the weakness is. <laughs> they have not got a left back. So eventually you're going to get a chance down there. Mm. And that's exactly what happened. And and did he go with Silva at left back or what was the formation? Yeah, well, no, clever. Um, so, I would say clever. Over clever, again. <laughs> yeah. So he does that where Silva is the one that, who stands in left back position. But as soon as they've got the ball, they go to a 3 2 4 1, right? And so they're, basically Silva's not there. They've just got back three. That's fine. When they lose the ball, he covers in the area and you've got back four and he's the left back. And, and that's fine because see if the opposition ain't got the ball, which they didn't have. Yeah. <laughs> but at 86%, it doesn't matter. My wee sister could play there. It's not important because yeah. there's nothing to defend. Um, but when they started losing control of the midfield then, you just thought, no, no, get a full back on there. No, you need somebody. You get need Aki on there. You need to cover that now because you're now getting stressed in that position. Um, and Pep didn't move, make the move quick enough, and they lost the goal from precisely that area. Um, and it's it's really clever until it's not clever, mm. and that's exactly what it was. And had they scored the second and third goals, it would have been genius because he's played three with two set midfielders, and Silva was unmarkable when he was going forward. Really, really smart. And I, again, 
95 percent, 98 percent of the time that works and it didn't this time yeah. but he didn't change it quick enough it is too clever by half really in many ways like i don't know what atmosphere Kinsella was contributing to behind the scenes but ah could it not have been sorted out you wonder and equally when you pack Sinchenko off to Arsenal uh, that you're left in this situation there are not many managers who would have so much credit in the bank that they could stand over that and not be yeah, shipping a lot of criticism yeah and also you know if some of this thick as me can see it coming you know I just I'm just I'm just saying get Aki on it's okay he can do that you've stuck him there before you know, he's, he's, he's one of these players who can play all the positions, including left back, and he's fine. He just do a good, sensible job in left back, and great, fantastic. And it was shouting and screaming and crying out to happen. Mm. Um, of course, you know, that that's from a more simplistic viewpoint than the way that Pep looks at it. And then by the end of the season, how many times will have played that trick and it's worked? And if they end up with a league championship, then he was right. You know, sometimes it doesn't. The old Mourinho thing, it doesn't matter if I get it wrong. Got it wrong. Yeah, I got it wrong there. Yeah, but I got it wrong right the last nine times I try it. So it's right. Yeah. Even though it was wrong that time. Uh, so after City's result against Arsenal, I think just the sheer weight of history meant that everybody said, well, here we go. Uh, but this is not that City side. I mean, they're not as liable at the moment to go on a 13 14 match and beaten run. And similarly, the weight of history was against Arsenal. Oh, here we go. Here comes the implosion. And geez, at uh, a goal down against Villa, that felt particularly the case. So what, a, what an amazingly interesting Saturday that in the space of a few hours, something a lot of people felt certain of was turned on its head on both fronts. So I mean, for, for Arsenal, the, 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 the psychological energy of that, of that afternoon must be incredible. Yeah. I mean, a couple of things to take any account. Um, Arsenal, 92 minutes into the game, mm. <laughs> they've blown it as far as we're concerned. Yeah. You know, until, of all people, Jorginho has won for 20 yards. I mean, really? I mean, Chelsea fans waited a long time. Somebody, I don't know if it's a true start. I, I think it probably is. Jorginho's last 22 goals are often for the penalty spot. <laughs> like, so he doesn't score. And I know that the goal's not given to him. I get that. But, you know, it's kind of his goal, right? Mm. So, that was well done, but wow, you're, you're pushing it there to say, you know, that was a, a, absolutely perfect from Arsenal, right? And exactly the same with City. The total and utter domination and should win the game and then they lose a late goal. It's the changeover in how we're all thinking about it and what is only a couple of minutes. And a couple of minutes could easily have gone a different way. Um, I have to say, the Arsenal won, they needed that because had they lost, you know, the the game against Everton, the game against Brentford, then that one, had they not won that, honestly, it didn't matter what happened with Man City, it would have been wheels off City. It would have been wheels off and they're never going to get back. But all for that two or three minutes at the end, and you don't really count the, the fourth one because it's a stupid breakaway. I'm so impressed with Arsenal because you keep on going, yeah, that's part of it. They were just about out, but they come back from it. Um, they actually never stopped doing what they're good at, which is brilliant. Even they never panicked, they never changed, they never adapted. Um, and if you take the look at the Brentford game, I, I was covering that. And you know, when you get things wrong, um, the Brentford game they should have won. Although Brentford had some very good chances himself, that goal should never have stood. So it is so thin at the moment. It's so much on a tight rope at the moment. And, and a number of people said, oh, Arsenal are going to win it now. And you're thinking, really? Mm. When it's that, I mean, any tiny little change in that end of either of those two games completely changes the entire narrative of it. I just think it's a brilliant, brilliant season now. And of course, well, they two are kind of arguing it out. United are just sneaking up, tiptoeing in the background. <laughs> well, I do want to talk to you about Liverpool and Manchester United. We will do that in just one moment. Very short ad break. Pat and Evan is staying with us. Our football show coverage is brought to you by Sky. You can watch Liverpool Real Madrid in the Champions League tomorrow night, live only on BT Sport. Back with Pat in just one second. Football on off the ball. With Sky. Watch every UEFA Champions League and Europa League match live on BT Sport this season. This is News Talk. 
Football on Off the Ball. With Sky. All the football you love in one place. Across Sky Sports, BT Sport and Premier Sports. You're very welcome back. Joe Malloy here. Pat Nevin is with us. We've been talking uh, in part one of the football show, in particular there before the break, about Arsenal and City. So with all of these teams, Pat, maybe because there is a vulnerability to all of them at the moment, there are uh, sliding doors moments. We saw that with Arsenal and Villa and Jorginho shot. We, sh- we saw that with, with City and, and none of those chances going in. If you take Manchester United and Liverpool, start with United when Harvey Barnes uh, cuts through and De Gea makes the save or Ian Acho's header, those first 20 minutes, goal or goals go in there. This could be very different. In the end, Rashford does his thing. 16 goals in 17 matches and Eric Ten Hag uh, afterwards is uh, pretty furious with the performance but things are looking very good on the table. They are. It's just, I'm just so happy for Rashford, you know, that he's been given the chance to be the main man, you know, and you know, beforehand he wasn't. Um, I think in the past he looked more like a wide attacker, definitely did to me. And you look up now and he's got the intelligence to go and drag players. Uh, he can be the central or drag players out wide like Thierry Henry for a period of time did. Uh, his comfort in his finishing now is, I mean, I'd love to know what that feels like, that every time you get the ball in front of goal, you just know you're going to score. Does, he, does, <laughs> does, he, does his finishing at the moment strike you as um, very much confidence-based or, or a touch more sustainable? Even when like a, a real uh, brilliant finisher like Van Nistelrooy might go through a drought, he was always a great finisher. Is, is Rashford a great finisher? Um, I, I think he can. Well, yeah, he is at the moment. Yeah, 100% he is at the moment because... The, even just to finish the first the first goal at the weekend there, um, the goalkeepers kind of stood up in a certain way, and he just took it in a slightly earlyish way, mm-hmm. and it, it was so unpanicked, it was so comfortable, it was so calm that you, you thought because he did this thing, I probably spotted it, and every Man United fan would have. He went up and he just slight looked to the left because yeah. there's a pass across right, and that's made the keeper think, oh, is he going to do that? And the keepers then rethought. Oh, I can't get done in my near post. Well, the keeper thought those two things, he just passed it in the net. Mm. And it's really, he's just so over everything. And I bet you in that moment, it went in slow motion for him. It absolutely went in slow motion. He was so ahead of it all. Yeah. So and, and, and what does he do when he hasn't scored in five, do you think? Yeah, position? exactly. Smash it, hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I'm getting to my lots of hell of a good strikers do that. Sure, smash it, sure. The best. And, it, and, and by the way, Many will be told to do that if it's not working for you, just smack it towards the goal, and you never know, you'll get a lucky one. Um, but where he is at the moment, it's it's fabulous to watch. And it's considering was it five league goals or five goals the season before, after you know being a good goal scorer for a while, you just thought, wow, that's unthinkable. Um, he but had, he's just he had a interesting comments in October. So everybody is putting down his form, his improved form, down to almost life away from the pitch being better and, and maybe fewer commitments, uh, less high profile commitments, certainly with the food banks. But if, a, a quote in October, uh, he said, it's a completely different energy around the club and the training ground. That puts me in a better headspace. Uh, that was the era I was struggling in. So maybe off the pitch, he's a happier person now. I don't know. But there's no doubt Old Trafford was a circus and that had to contribute. Yeah. I'd, again, the classic one, if you're a manager that knows how to get the best out of players and knows how to get inside certain players' heads and knows what they need. And, you know, he's just walked in. And, I mean, I, again, I I think it was more to, as much to do with Ronaldo going. Um, Cristiano goes, he's now the main striker, the main man, and he's allowed to flourish. And that makes a big difference. The amount of times I've seen players have got a big player in front of them who's a kind of, you know, a world-famous player. And the guy... Next and turn is just kind of slightly yeah. shrugged shoulders. You know, it happens all the time. Um, why? Why the, isn't there? Um, it's that's such an interesting point. Why isn't there room in teams for two, three, four alphas? Well, well, there is if you're Barcelona and teams gone by. But you're right; it's very, very common. It's usually it's, it's usually because of that strength of personality. Like, um, remember years ago playing with Big Duncan Ferguson, right? You be Big Duncan's up there. You go shot for a ball and say, give us a... Oh, it's gone. <laughs> it's launched. 
and everybody looks up and that's the easy ball. That's the obvious ball. That's the demanded ball. That's what you're expected to do by yourself, by history, by the personality, etc. And everything, not everything, but the vast majority goes to them. I'm sure we had this conversation many, many times before. I remember watching Willie Ann playing with Neymar. And Willie Ann could be the best player in the world. You wouldn't know it. Because they didn't win in Neymar. They just bang, 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 bang. Ne whoever was on the other side, it was as if the, the pitch was on a slant. <laughs> it's not coming up there, mate. And that's, you get that. So you might, you have to remember you get only a certain amount of touches in the game. So if you're a forward and you get eight touches in the final third, but he's getting 24. And by the way, he's getting the ones that you should have been getting when you were free in space because everyone's looked at him first. Mm. So that's kind of what happens. And it's why it's, it's so counterintuitive. Now, it's something I always talk about and it always gets slaughtered by people who send a lot of statistics at you. You know, you see the guy who's scoring all the goals, he actually might be a problem. He really might be a problem. Or, you know, the guy who's the main man who's, mm. you know, seems to be, he might be the one that's holding everything up. He's, he is the logjam. And I'm, and to be Ronaldo, when you stick the personality thing on top of that, that added to the logjam thing. And with the waning powers, not to score goals, but the waning powers to do everything else. Yeah. So that whole side of it, people always think, you know, you, I remember somebody saying, yeah, you're just jealous of so-and-so. I remember saying that about Beckham to some degree. No, no, no. If you've been inside there, you know what the dynamic is. And you look at your mates and go, stop giving them the ball there. It's the wrong ball. Give it, just don't care. It's a red shot or a blue shot. Give it to the right one, not to the only one that everyone else is doing. Mm. So that that's not uncommon. It's really not uncommon. But if you're Ronaldo, when, you, when he's Ronaldo, he's best, it's fine. Yes. And when you're yeah. Messi, best, it's fine. Yeah. But when it's not, it's an enemy. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, you can see it even Ronaldo, particularly younger players, Manchester United, would just give him the ball if he came looking for it, regardless of. Uh, it only ever happened on. to me once. Only ever, my entire career only happened. So 850 games, internationals, everything. And I played one game where I kept on getting the ball and I kept on trying to find the same guy every time. Every time. Every time. And I, just, I didn't look at the other passes. Now, my excuse was it was A, Kenny Dalglish. It was his 100th cap <laughs> and he needed one more goal to break the Scottish record. Fair enough. <laughs> and we were playing against Luxembourg. So we were going to win it anyway, <laughs> right? So... And that was the only reason. But CNL to my entire career, I could not care less. Mm. Play the right ball. Just play the right ball. And that is, it's easy to say, but then if you're kind of as pig-headed as me, you'll do it. Yeah. Like I said, Eric Ten Hag was like furious afterwards. You know, like we didn't stick to the plan. It was a shambles. First half, things better second half. So, you know, he wasn't just uh, accepting plaudits. And he's had that very... Um, serious militant uh, approach which is obviously uh, bearing fruit post Fergie only 2018 have United had more points at this stage of the season that was under Mourinho and they finished second that year they are within five points of Arsenal Arsenal have a game in hand they've played the same number of games as City and amazingly they're just three points off City I still find it very hard to see United as really part of this title race I, I don't think they're as good a team as Manchester City, but it doesn't mean you can't win the league. You know, it doesn't mean you can't go on a run if you've got, obviously, Rashford, but you've got a real belief without, within the group. Um, and the momentum's been brilliant. The momentum has been fantastic for them. They could do me making sure that uh, they don't lose one or two players that are absolutely, you know, crucial to them. That's big as well. But they've got... I don't think they're fearing anyone now. They're turning up to games now and thinking... Yeah, this feels right. Mm. You, you know, Old Trafford feels like Old Trafford again, which makes a massive, massive difference. The expectation is it's going to happen. Um, the fact that I'm not saying the fans weren't behind, the fans are always behind United. And, you know, however angry they are with the club, they're, they're usually phenomenal with uh, the players. But at the moment, if you're on that sort of run, there's no reason. And the other thing they've got is, <laughs> I hesitate to say it, limited expectations. No one expected it. No one's seen it. No one thought, oh, we're ready to catch Manchester City. And that's a weight off your shoulders. I mean, they've already, to some degree, overperformed what people were expecting of them. That, that won't last. I mean, next season, the expectations will be back up there again. But um, that actually helps a lot. The biggest call will be if they do actually get there and get level with Arsenal and Man City, 
right, you know, they're not far off, but level with them, right, that changes everything. Right? That changes the mentality of everything. And that's where Fergie was always brilliant because he was able to keep the mentality right all the way to the end and maybe stronger than anyone else. Um, we've, we'll find out if that's the case. Mm. Well, we might find out, but they, keep, they have to keep on winning. I mean, but they're in there. There's no doubt they're in there for okay. sure, the chance of winning it. Uh, to continue sliding doors team Everton hit the post Liverpool score explosive goal that we haven't seen in some time and this week has therefore uh, been very different to what it could have been Uh, definitely signs of life and energy against Everton and then it was backed up uh, to an extent against Newcastle and and someone like Stefan Bacicic comes in and shows lovely touches and who doesn't like an 18 year old uh, adding to you know stale midfield quote unquote they have Real Madrid tomorrow so what are we saying here? Signs of life or they're back or would not get too excited at all? Wait. <laughs> Just wait. That's, this is not the answer um, I want from a pundit. I, I, I want less uh, even-handedness. No, you, no, I'm, I'm not getting carried away yet. Okay. No, absolutely not. No, not. Not to... Look, they've got really good players and it's good to see you know, one or two back looking closer to what they were before. But, you know, is Everton, we, we know Everton haven't been at their best yet. Yeah. They've lifted a bit with Sam. The Newcastle one was bizarre. Newcastle started brilliantly and then it's just this complete meltdown of people getting sent off and goals coming in from nowhere. And it was a strange old game. I think we'll find a lot uh, a lot more out. Not necessarily against Real Madrid. I think the runner games after that is quite good. If they can see their way past Wolves, um, if they can see their way past um, Palace yeah. um, and find themselves standing beside Manchester United in the game after that, thinking, right, OK, now we'll know. See, if they win those next three games, I would say, yeah. Because, yeah, it's, well, it's well, not exactly back, but... <laughs> if, they win their, if they win their two in hand, they're one point off fourth, which is just amazing. Which is brilliant, brilliant for them. They've, they've certainly improved, definitely. If you take Jordan Henderson as a pretty good um, uh, bellwether of where they might be, uh, like against Everton, that was the first time I saw him looking full of energy. Not just getting through games, not just being a professional, but I mean like bouncing. It, it's funny, there's been some games recently with Liverpool and you just look at them and you think, do, do you really believe anymore? Mm. You know, was it the Wolves game? Was it, yeah, that was, was bad. That was that was real low. And you would think, wow, well, do, you, do you believe in, in anymore? Do you believe in the messages coming out? And you could tell that um, Klopp was definitely worried about it very worried at that point in time uh, but you know teams go through slumps and they went through a little bit of the uh, quite a big bit of a slump and they have to remember we always have to remember what we are gauging them against is unreal you know the teams the manchester city and liverpool what they did for a couple of years a few years that was just ridiculous it never happened before may never happen again because i think the premier league's got a lot of stronger teams in it now um so they were gauging them against a very very high bar um but you know, as is it beyond them to get top four? I think it's it's pushing it, but it's it's not impossible. I don't think it's impossible. If you look, who's ahead of them? Brighton, yeah, they can do them. Fulham, you can do them. Newcastle, I, I'm, I have to say, I I wouldn't be surprised if it's a slide by Newcastle. Mm. So you've you're then talking Spurs, Man U, Man City, Arsenal. It's going to be hard, but maybe Spurs are the one that you could maybe catch there. There's a lot of ifs in there, but it's not beyond the bounds Mm. of possibility. Absolutely not. Uh, You realise when you mentioned Everton there, you had one of the great Freudian slips. Go on, what did I say? You said they've regrouped a bit under Sam. Oh, (laughs) that is a brilliant Freudian slip. (laughs) And I totally was like, I I see where he's coming from. I see that. Exactly. That's brilliant. I love that. Um, (laughs) Funnily enough, it's the Sam... uh, with Daesh, you know, that they're not actually the same. They're not, but you know where the similar similarities are. Yeah. Um, they're, they're actually both, the thing I think of them both, everyone thinks of them as simplistic football, kind of long ball, very structured in a very, very set, obvious way. Everyone thinks that, right, fine. They're also two of the cleverest guys out there. Both of them were, absolutely. And both of them were incredibly innovative at the best in their own ways. Mm. And they wouldn't have got their teams. Bolton wouldn't have got to where they were going. Burnley wouldn't have got to where they were going without certain types of innovation that they did. The bit of an innovation uh, that, that uh, Dyche has brought, brought uh, I don't know if, I'm sure you have heard, many of our listeners have heard, where he um, just asked all the players, or got the players to 
say what the problems were, you know. And I don't think they had the names in when they were with the, when they wrote them down. So he basically got all the information he needed. It, so if you don't know, there's no comeback on it. You know, you'll find out what the problems are or what are the considered pro- what you consider the problems are. Yeah. And like, it's the most obvious thing that uh, a cod management specialist would tell you in an executive meeting with PowerPoint, right? And you go, oh, go on, give us a break. But it's brilliant because nobody really does it in yeah. football. Yeah. And he's just got, and he, he was saying afterwards, he's got, I've got a lot of information, but the best bit of information he got was a lot of them felt the same thing was the problem. He didn't tell us what that problem was. Yeah. But, and I thought, how brilliant. Because you're not going to tell everybody the problem. That was the last thing you should do in that situation. <laughs> So, um, and, it's, and it was brilliant. It was really clever. So, you know, for the, the both of them, you know, Sam, Sam was like that as well, definitely. And, and by the way, brief point, how dare anyone try and take away Seamus Coleman's intent there? I mean, come on. <laughs> it's because it's a fullback. If it had been any other position, yeah. they wouldn't have. Um, but it's just so unusual, a position, isn't it? It's such an unusual angle. You find yourself... Um, the thing, do you know what? I, I waited to hear what Seamus said because he won't tell you. If no, it was a mistake, he'd just tell you. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's not the type that would would say, "Yeah, I meant it when I didn't." Mm. But he, yeah, he spotted it. No, it was a, a brilliant, brilliant finish. And I mean, see Everton fifteenth uh, at the moment. Wow, there's not. It's been a long time since we've uh, yeah got any sort of lift from Everton. So you know, there's a lot of teams down there, and I certainly haven't said at any point I thought they were definite to go down. Um, but there's a lot of teams down there, and it's it's not obvious at the moment. It's still not obvious, and I still wouldn't call Leeds other teams starting to get down. Southampton looked the most likely, um, but other than that, it's really tough to call. Mm. We will uh, put a pin in it for now, and we will reconvene next Monday. I would hope. Pat, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Look forward to it. See you then. Cheers. Bye-bye. Our uh, football show coverage is, of course, brought to you by Sky. And you can watch Liverpool take on Real Madrid in the Champions League tomorrow night, live only on BT Sport. Football on Off the Ball. With Sky. Watch every UEFA Champions League and Europa League match live on BT Sport this season. This is News Talk.